The following is a message from the pulpit of the Bible Baptist Church of Tuscaloosa, Alabama, led by Pastor Philip Blackwell. It is our desire that God would use this message to be a help and a blessing to you. If you're looking for a traditional church where Christ is preeminent and the membership is family, we invite you to come and be our guest. Now may God bless you as you listen. of Psalm, uh, Psalms, <coughs> excuse me, find in your Bibles the book of Psalms and look for Psalm number 22, Psalm number 22. Once you find your place there, let's stand out of love and respect for the Word of God. I just want to give you a few thoughts here from Psalm number 22, Psalm 22. We'll start reading there in verse number 1. Psalm 22 and verse number 1. The Bible says in Psalm 22 and verse 1, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? O my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. Jump down to verse 6. But I am a worm and no man a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of my mother's womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God, from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax that is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. And my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them. And cast lots upon my vesture. But be not thou far from me, O Lord. My, O my strength, haste. To haste thee to help me, deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. Now let's pray. And tonight I'm going to be preaching from this text on this thought, the sufferings of the Savior, the sufferings of the Savior. Let's pray together. Lord, we are grateful tonight that we get to be here on a Wednesday evening and hear your word. Now, Lord, I understand tonight that as we're gathered here, Lord, we're remembering your death. Lord, when you went to Calvary and you died on the cross, that each of us that are in this room tonight could have eternal life. And, Lord, tonight I pray that as I try to preach through Psalm 22, some of the points, God, I pray that you would arrest our attention tonight. And, God, I pray that you would soften our hearts. And, Lord, I pray that you would draw us closer to you. God, we sure need you tonight. God, we need that help that cometh from above. And so, Lord, I pray that as I try to preach your word, that you might allow me to be filled with the Spirit of God, that I might be able to aptly uh, portray the portion of Scripture that we are looking at tonight. God, we sure need you. We need your help. And Lord, as we think about our crucified Christ, Lord, our suffering Savior, Lord, I pray you would do a work in our hearts and draw us closer to you. And Lord, I pray when the final amen of this service is given, God, I pray you'd be pleased with everything that's said and done tonight. God, help us and bless our time together. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated this evening. 
King David, who authored this psalm, faced many dark and difficult days, but it's clear, to, it's easily to ascertain from this portion of Scripture that David is not talking about himself. He is talking about the one that is to come. There are many chapters or psalms in the book of Psalms that are called Messianic Psalms, and Psalm 22 is probably one of the greatest Messianic Psalms that's found in the pages of the Hebrew hymn book, the book of Psalms. And what you'll find here in Psalm number 22 we'll find uh, the the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ that's going to be prophesied about at least 1,000 years before it's fulfilled. Now imagine how detailed this is and imagine how people can deny the word of God when what is revealed in the Gospels is clearly depicted uh, in these verses of Scripture. 1,000 years before anyone had ever heard the name Jesus He is prophesied of that he would come and that he would die on the cross uh, for the sins of man. The first part of this psalm uh, begins in a sob. But the second part, we're going to see it ends with a song. We're going to see that the first part of this psalm begins with a cross, but then it's going to end with a crown. The first part of this psalm is going to begin with great gloom. But friend, at the end of this psalm, there's going to be great glory that is going to be revealed about our our suffering Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we look at this psalm tonight, I want us to detail his suffering. We're going to talk about his inward suffering and also his outward suffering, but also his upward suffering toward his Father that's in heaven. And tonight as we look at Psalm 22, it is my prayer today that God would take this psalm and write it upon your heart uh, during this time. Now, I know that many people believe in Good Friday, and I'm not going to get up here and I'm not going to crucify anybody that, that, that does that, but I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ did not die on a Friday. I believe if you look at three days and three nights, which the Bible says he was going to be uh, buried, we find that he would have had had to have been put in that tomb in the evening uh, on a Wednesday evening. And so uh, that's what the scripture teaches when you look at the timeline. And I understand that some people have Good Friday services. And I'll say this, if the gospel is being preached, uh, praise the Lord that the gospel is being preached. But the fact is this, the Lord did not die on a Friday. He died on a Wednesday. And so I thought it very uh, important for us tonight to look at this portion of scripture and to remember his death Uh, before we celebrate his resurrection on Sunday morning. Now, there are many different things in Psalm 22 that we can look at, uh, but we want to look at the particulars of this uh, Savior Psalm, of this uh, Psalm that details the suffering of our Savior. Hey, we want to look at a few things tonight that might help us Uh, during this season. Let me give it to you real quickly and we'll be done. Number one, in verses one and two, we find a deserted Savior. We find in verses one and two, a deserted Savior. I know that I quoted this verse, I believe it was last Sunday, but here it is in the text. This is revealing the thought and the prayer that was on the heart and mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you look at verse number one and verse number two, here's what Jesus says there as he's on that cross. He says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, and thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. You realize when Jesus was on the cross, uh, in that few hours, it was both day and night. In the morning time when he was crucified there, and as he was dying on the cross, remember, God turned out the lights of heaven. And so you find the Lord Jesus Christ when he got to the cross and not only as he was put on the cross but also when that thick darkness covered the land the Lord Jesus Christ was crying out to his heavenly father and he said my God, my God why hast thou forsaken me? And friend I want you to know that Jesus knew the answer to this question. This was not a question that he was seeking an answer. He fully understood why uh, his father in heaven was forsaking him at that time. Hey, this is a rhetorical question. It's one that is uh, that is put there to make us to think why he was being forsaken uh, by his father. And so what we find in Psalm 22 verses 1 and 2, we find a deserted Savior. See, Jesus shared a unique relationship with God the Father. 
It was the relationship that was never broken in eternity past, and it would and it'll never be broken again in eternity future. But this one time in all of eternity, we find that the Father withdraws fellowship from the Son. You say, preacher, how can that happen? How can God deny Himself? How can God turn His back on Himself? Hey, I have not all the answers about that. Hey, I believe what the Bible says, and at this time, God the Father literally withdrew his fellowship from the Son. And the Son looked up to heaven and he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Hey, the Father, it is said that uh, Jesus concerning his Father, I do always the things that please him. The Father who said of Jesus, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hey, the Father in that desperate hour of suffering shut himself up in heaven and abandoned his Son to the horrors of the cross. Why? He was abandoned by God that you and I might never know what it is to be abandoned by God. The Son of God went to the cross of Calvary and he suffered and he bled and he died there and he died uh, uh, departed from God or deserted by God the Father and he cried out oh my God uh, why hast thou forsaken me and that will be the cry of the damned and doomed in hell and those that will be one day cast into the lake of fire for all of eternity they will be crying out to God my God my God why hast thou forsaken me and the answer is this hey the reason God will forsake those in the lake of fire is because they did not believe on Jesus who was forsaken by God for their sin. So here on the cross of Calvary we find the deserted Savior. Next number two we find not only on the cross was he a deserted Savior but number two he was a despised Savior. Would you jump down to verse number six notice the subject of their despising in verse number six Jesus says simply this first few words. He says, but I am a worm and no man. So people were looking on the Lord Jesus Christ. This was their thought toward Him. Hey, they viewed Him to be insignificant. Hey, in this description, they're saying that He who's dying on the cross, He is not who He said He was. He is just a worm. He is not a man. But you know... As I was thinking about that word worm, you know what I read today? I thought it was pretty interesting. He said, uh, one of the commentaries I read, it said the word worm refers to a specific worm that is in the Middle East. It's a scarlet colored worm. And what's interesting about this scarlet colored worm is that they were crushed and their blood was used to make a rare, cross, uh, costly crimson dye used for the robes of kings. That's where they got the crimson from. You know, here in Tuscaloosa, it's crimson tide. Hey, without these worms in the Middle East back then, they wouldn't have had that crimson color. And what we find here is that that worm would literally be crushed and they would use the blood of that worm and that worm would make beautiful, costly array for people to put on. And I thought about that. I thought about this. Isn't it wonderful to know that our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, suffered on the cross of Calvary? He allowed, we, we put upon Him the robes of our sin, our rags, our ungodliness. And you know what He clothes us with because of His blood? His robe of righteousness. Hey, we're made clean through the blood of Jesus Christ. We're made royalty through the blood of Jesus Christ. And you and I, because of this rejected and despised Savior, hey, you and I get to enjoy the glory of heaven because he was crushed for the sins of mankind see as we continue to read look what the Bible goes on to say in verse number 6 it says but I am a worm and no man a reproach of men and despised of the people so the people were a, uh, Jesus was a reproach to the people they should have been looking for him they should have accepted him but the Bible says that he was a reproach to them and as you continue to look it says he was despised of the people the people hated Jesus Christ. Look what it says in verse number 7. All they that see me shall laugh me to scorn. Is that not what they were doing at the cross? Were they not laughing the Son of God to shame there on the cross? And notice it says they shoot out the lip. They shake their head saying he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him seeing he delighted in him. Hey those folks around the cross were quoting scripture. And they didn't even realize it. You would have thought someone listening around that cross would have picked up on some of this stuff. 
Jews were very religious people. They knew the word of God. And here are people that are fulfilling the scripture. He was despised of men. Look what the Bible says. Jump down, if you will, to verse number 12. The Bible says, many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. So notice the, the, the uh, severity of their despisal. They would, not, uh, they would not relent. They continued. Here's the harmless Holy Son of God dying on the cross. And all he is is speaking words of grace as he's dying there. He even says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And in spite of all of his words of grace, they will not stop. They continually pour it upon him. They continually uh, get, uh, continually speak evil against him. See the severity of their despisal. He was a despised Savior. Number three. We see a deserted Savior, a despised Savior. Number three, notice a distressed Savior. Look at verse number 14. Here Jesus was feeling emotional stress. You know how sometimes you feel inner stress and you feel like you're going to break under it? You know, the Lord Jesus Christ is, is, uh, knows all about that. Look at verse number 14 and notice the, the way the scripture is worded. It says, I am poured out like water. All of my bones are out of joint. Notice, my heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. We'll talk about the water in just a few minutes. But notice it says that his heart is melted in the midst of his bowels. You know what's interesting to me? Is that the hand, uh, this, uh, the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ is seen in these verses? Hey, it was him in compassion that he touched the leper, that he healed the blinded eyes, that he restored hearing to the deaf ears. Oh, Jesus did much because of his compassion. He even said, I forgive. But here we find that the heart of the Savior is finally broken. The Lord's heart's broken. I read, I, I'm not a medical doctor, so I couldn't tell you the veracity of this statement, but I've read where medical doctors have stated that the reason that he was talking about water and his heart being like wax and being melted, and when the, uh, the centurion took the sword and pierced his side and blood and water came out, they said it, that is because of an enlarged heart that burst. There's the Lord on the cross with a broken heart. Why does he have a broken heart? Is it because those around him? No. It's because our sins were being placed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, his heart was broken because of sin. It was broken because our sin was placed on him. Hey, the Bible talks about him who knew no sin was made sin for us. Our sin was placed upon him there on that cross. And friend, there was an emotional component to his suffering there that you and I can't even begin to understand. Can you imagine? having all the sin of the entire world placed upon you placed upon your body and you being smitten and stricken of God and being afflicted by God for every single sin that entered into the world oh I know we think about the sins of great sinners like Hitler and friend Jesus died for every one of Hitler's sins we think about all the different sinners that have ever lived but I want to tell you the most amazing thing to me is this not only did Jesus die for uh, all people he died for me and my sins was placed upon him when he was suffering on the cross and he had a broken heart it was not because of just the sin of the world it was because of my sin and it was because of your sin it was not because of the nails that scarred his sacred flesh it was not because of the, uh, the spear that pierced his side hey it was because of a broken heart because of the sins of men being placed upon him so we find the Savior, he was a despised Savior. We find he was a deserted Savior. We find that he was a distressed Savior. We see his emotional stress, but notice he also had physical distress. Look at verse 14 again. I'll, I'll hurry. The Bible says, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. All of his bones were out of joint. Now you think about the pain he was in. His physical body is now, oh, not a bone was broken according to the scriptures. Not one, but the Bible says that all of his bones were out of joint. 
His heart uh, was like wax. And look down at verse number 15. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me to the dust of death. The dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. That's the Gentiles. They pierced my hands and feet. I'll pause and say this. Death by crucifixion had not been invented in Psalm 22 and verse 16. Isn't it amazing? Here we have David talking about something that's going to be invented years after he wrote. But there they pierced his hands and his feet. Notice it also says in verse number 17, look what it says, I may tell all my bones. That word tell means to count. He said he can look down at his bones, his ribs, all of his bones. He can count every single one of them. See, these words remind us that Almighty God suffered for the sins of humanity. The one who clothed the mountains with purple majesty, the one who decorated the night sky with millions of twinkling stars suffered in my place and he suffered in your place. Hey, that God should, that God should suffer seems to be an impossibility, but the suffering of the cross was real and it was for us. It's not a fairy tale. We read through the Gospels and we get to the crucifixion and no longer does our hearts tremble within us. No longer do we stand in awe of that old rugged cross. No longer do we weep when we hear about His suffering for us. Hey friend, it ought to cause us hurt in our heart because of the distress of the Savior. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, by His stripes we're healed. Isaiah 1 teaches us that His blood makes us whiter than snow. It's all because of Calvary. So we find a despised Savior, distressed Savior. Let me give you number four and we'll, be, we'll hurry and we'll be done. We also find a defying Savior. There's something interesting. I can show you several things throughout the remainder of the, of the verses. But look down, if you will. Let's jump down to verse number 22. The Lord has been crucified. When you get to the Lord, verse 22, you find him dead. He's dead when he comes off that cross. But notice after his death, look what he says in verse 22. I will, that's future tense. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. You know what he's talking about, verse 22? Don't miss this. His resurrection. He's dead. But then after his death, he's going to be alive again that he might declare uh, the Lord to his brethren and in the midst of the congregation. Hey, the Lord Jesus Christ, though he's going to suffer, bleed, and die, hey, can I tell you, he is going to be a defying Savior for he's going to defy death. You know, he has the keys, by the way. He has the keys to hell and death, and he can unlock that door anytime he wants. After three days and three nights of being in the heart of the earth, we find that Jesus got up. He got up. He was raised from the dead. Hey, I can imagine. Can you imagine while he's down there in paradise? Can you imagine Adam recognizing who he was? Can you imagine Jacob remembering that he wrestled with him? Can you imagine Joshua, hey, seeing the one who declared himself the captain of the Lord's host? Can you imagine Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who knew their companion that was walking around in the fiery furnace? Hey, Jesus comes through and they say, there he is. But after three days and three nights, they, they all say together, there he goes. <laughs> Death couldn't hold him. He got up. And friend, what a blessing it is to know that our Savior is now resurrected and now he's entered and sat down on his eternal throne. And friend, he's paid the price for sin. And now he's waiting to receive those who will believe on him. Can you imagine the procession of heaven after he ascended? Here he comes. Here's the Lord. He'd been gone for 33 and a half years. Now he's back to inhabit his eternal throne. I can imagine those bees saying, Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty. I can imagine the saints that are there rejoicing and praising. Hey, I can just imagine the scene and the sounds and the sights of glory in that day. I'm thankful that not only did he did he come as a despised Savior and a distressed Savior and a, and a deserted Savior? I'm thankful that he also was that defying Savior. He defied death, hell, and the grave. And here's something that's even greater than that. He's coming back. And we look forward to that time. Let's stand together.
Here's what we're going to do tonight. I'd like to ask you to come and let's kneel around the altar tonight. There's much more I could say in Psalm 22. It's so rich. But let's come as a church family. I know some of you may not be able to, and that's okay. If, if you can't come, that's okay. But you who can, let's go ahead and come to the altar. Thank you for listening to this message today. It is our prayer that this sermon fed your soul, lifted your spirit, and encouraged you in your walk with God. And as we conclude, please remember, there's always a place for you at Bible Baptist Church.